So in the last video, we talked about the discrete choice model, uh, which is a way that we can, can model uh, economic agents making choices across a discrete set of alternatives. Uh, we talked about that very broadly, kind of the setup of the problem. And now in this video, we're gonna talk about the random utility model, which is we're gonna, how we're gonna take that kind of general economic framework and turn it into an actual econometric model. So the, the setup here is that Discrete choices are usually modeled under the assumption of utility maximizing behavior by the decision maker. Sometimes we're gonna be thinking about firms and profit, in which case then we're gonna be thinking about maybe a profit maximizing firm instead of a utility maximizing agent, but, but, but basically everything that falls through is gonna be similar. And so the random utility model is gonna give us a framework to think about how a decision maker makes a utility maximizing choice over a discrete set of alternatives. Um, and the basic idea here, so we're gonna set it up so that the agent gets some amount of utility from each of the alternatives. And that amount of utility can depend on observed characteristics of the different alternatives, observed characteristics of the decision maker, and then also some unobserved characteristics. And then, and then we're just gonna say that the agent selects the alternative that provides the greatest utility if they're, if they're utility maximizing. So it turns out that models derived from the random utility model are consistent with utility maximization uh, or profit maximization in the case of the firm, even if we don't think that the decision maker is actually maximizing utility. So maybe you think that the decision maker is not really like a, you know, a, a perfectly rational economic agent that can perfectly determine utility and, and, and figure out what would give, give them the most utility. Maybe there's some other kind of heuristic that they're using to make choices. It turns out that even if the decision maker is not actually maximizing utility, when we use a random utility model, the choice is still gonna be consistent with, with, with the concept of utility maximization. So it's still gonna fit nicely within kind of our basic like neoclassical economic framework. Um, but I do wanna point out also that random utility models can be highly flexible, can include all kinds of like behavioral informational parameters that might cause us to, to, to kind of diverge from like the, the, the very standard neoclassical model. So um, it's possible to, to include some of those kind of behavioral parameters, behavioral, uh, you know, testing some, some behavioral models, that kind of stuff kind of, within a random utility model in some cases. All right, so how do we actually specify the random utility model? I just described it kind of in general terms. Let's get a little more formal here. So the model from the perspective of the decision maker is gonna be that, that decision maker N, we're gonna have multiple decision makers in our data typically, but we're gonna start by, by thinking about one, which we call lowercase N. They're gonna face a choice among capital J alternatives and each one of those alternatives, let's call it alternative lowercase j, is going to provide utility of capital U. And then we're going to subscript it with nj here to say this is the amount of utility for decision maker n from alternative lowercase j. And so for each decision maker, we're going to have a utility value for all capital J alternatives. And then simply the decision maker chooses the alternative with the greatest utility. Or to put that a little more formally, N is gonna choose I if and only if the utility from I is greater than the utility from J for all J not equal to I. I mean, to put it in, in more uh, kind of lay terms, the decision maker is gonna look at all their possible alternatives. I mean, think about them kind of ranking them and saying, whichever one gives me the most utility, that's what I want and choose that alternative. Here's the problem though. We, the econometricians, we don't actually observe utility. We can't kind of like reach into people's brains or hearts and, and, or, and, and see how many utils they're getting from different choices or different alternatives. What we do observe though, is the chosen alternative, some attributes of each of the alternatives, and, and maybe some attributes of the decision maker also. And so we're gonna use these, these pieces of data to infer what utilities must have been and how each of those observed attributes affects utility. 
And the way we're going to do this is by uh, first by kind of decomposing that utility into two components. So we've got total utility U, capital U. That's the thing that the, the decision makers choosing uh, the alternative that maximizes capital U utility. But we're going to decompose that into two different utility components. We're going to have a capital V, which is going to be the utility that comes from observed factors. On the last slide, I just talked about how we're going to observe some attributes of alternatives and decision makers. And so we can put all of that kind of stuff into, into capital V, the utility of observed factors. And then we're also going to have this epsilon, which is going to going to be the, the utility of all the unobserved factors, anything that might affect utility that we don't observe. This might seem a little restrictive, but it's actually totally general, right? We're just saying that, that there's some total amount of utility. We can observe some portion of that, which we're going to call capital V, and then everything else that we don't observe, we're going we're gonna to call epsilon. That's, to that's totally general. We're not really making any kind of special assumptions here yet. So this capital V, we're going to call that representative utility. And it's going to be a function of uh, both attributes of the alternatives and a vector of attributes of the decision maker. And I'm, I'm going to try to use some notation here, uh, not only in these slides, but throughout the whole semester, where when, when we have things that are just um, like a scalar or a random variable, just a single number or variable, I'll use uh, just, just kind of normal normal math text here. Uh, but then when we have things that are vectors, I'm going to try to make those bold. So here I'm bolding the X and the S to indicate that um, th that we have a vector of attributes. We might observe, uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, someone choosing a car, we might observe the price of the car, uh, the engine size, the, the you know, the horsepower, gas mileage, the how many seats it has, what interior area it, uh, volume is, what the cargo volume is. You know, we could do, we can have, we might have, you know, dozens or hundreds of attributes that we could include there. And, and then similar, we might observe things about a decision maker, uh, age, income, uh, race, marital status, you know, um, education level, all kinds of other kind of socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic things. And so ultimately this, uh, uh, representative utility that's going to be a function of all of these all of these different attributes all the different data that we observe and then the epsilon is going to be everything that affects utility that's not that we're not putting into v the representative utility and so one thing to point out here is that is that then epsilon depends importantly on the specification of capital V, representative utility. As we observe more data and we can put more things into capital V, there's kind of less things implicitly buried inside of epsilon. And alternatively, if we don't observe very much data, we don't have very much going into capital V, then there's really a lot sitting here in this, this epsilon term, this, this utility of unobserved factors. Now, this is the utility of unobserved factors. So what do we do with it? Well, what we're going to do in the random utility model is treat this term as a random variable. If we don't know what it is, then let's just treat it as random. We're thinking that the decision maker knows what it is. They know their preferences, but, but we don't observe enough to, to say anything about it. So we're just going to treat it as random. And that's where the term random utility model comes from. And then ultimately, we're going to say that there's this uh, joint density, right? We're going to, so, so let me point this out real quick. Every, epsilon, let me say this, epsilon has a subscript n lowercase j. That means that each decision maker, n, is going to have an epsilon value for every one of the alternatives. There's going to be some unobserved random utility that differs for every one of the alternatives. So if we go back to that example about how you get to campus, we might observe some attributes of all the different, uh, all the different alternatives. But then at the end of the day, a single person trying to decide how to get to campus, they're going to have some random epsilon value for every one of those alternatives. And then we're also just going to note right here that, that there's going to be some joint density. These things are all random variables. So they're going to have some joint density, which we're just going to call F 
uh, and, and we'll talk a lot about what this joint density is and what we can assume about it throughout the semester. Okay, so let's dig just a little deeper into representative utility. Uh, like I said, we model representative utility, that capital V, as a function of uh, a vector of attributes of the alternative, a vector of attributes of the decision maker, and then ultimately that's where the structural parameters come in. There's going to be a vector of structural parameters that is also part of our model of representative utility. Oftentimes, or maybe even usually, and certainly in this class, we're going to specify representative utility as a linear function. So we can write it down just like this. V is going to be this linear function of our parameters, beta, and all of our data, x. Here I just changed it. Let, from now on, let's just say that x represents everything. It could be data about the alternative or the decision maker, um, uh, even though up here I called it x and s. But let's just collapse everything down to being in, inside of something called x to make it a little easier for our notation. So we're just saying, random uh, uh, representative utility is this linear function of our structural parameters that we want to estimate and our data. This might seem restrictive, but remember, a linear function is actually highly flexible. It can include things like interactions, higher order terms. We could think about using like splines or bins if we want to get kind of semi or non-parametric and how we estimate things here. Uh, obviously, how we make these choices is going to affect um, kind of how many parameters we have to estimate and what those parameters mean. But at the end of the day, assuming linearity here in most cases is not going to be restrictive. And in fact, most utility functions can be closely approximated by, by some function that's linear in parameters. Um, and we're going to make this linear assumption in most cases just because things get a lot more complicated when, when we move to nonlinear utility. And so if we can use simple linear utility that closely approximates real utility functions, then, and, and, and that, that's much easier than nonlinear, then we're going to do it. Okay, so if we make that linear assumption about representative utility, let's write down what the total utility is going to be, right? The total utility that alternative J gives to decision maker N then is going to be this linear function of our parameters and our data plus that random unobserved utility component epsilon. Now let's stop here for a second and look at this a little more closely. What does this look like? If you're familiar with running OLS regressions, this might look like an OLS regression equation, right? We've got some outcome, which is a linear function of parameters or coefficients and data plus an error term. If we observed utility, we could just run an OLS regression to estimate these parameters. The problem here is we don't actually observe utility. We're going to have to use observed choices, kind of the results of utility, to infer what these parameters are. Now, I've talked a lot about these parameters. What are they actually? Right, so these structural parameters beta, if we look at this function again, or this equation, they tell us how these observable attributes, the x's, relate to our unobserved utility. Right, they're kind of defining that relationship. How do changes in the, the data, the attributes, affect someone's utility? With a linear representative utility, like we've written down right here, we can interpret these parameters as being marginal utilities. They're going to tell us, you know, if, if X is something like price or income or something like that, then the parameter on that is going to tell us what is the marginal utility of money. If something like, uh, uh, you know, let's go back to the car example that I briefly mentioned, maybe we have miles per gallon on the right hand side then the parameter on miles per gallon is going to tell us something about how much utility someone gets from the efficiency of their car. So these are going to be really important structural parameters that we think are, are kind of define someone's true underlying preferences for various attributes. Uh, and, 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 and that's going to be uh, important. Th those are important parameters for us to know and understand in this kind of choice setting. <clears throat> 
Of course, we can get different kinds of structural parameters with different models of utility, profit, whatever. In this case, in this class, a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to ultimately be marginal utilities, and then we're going to see what we can do once we know those marginal utilities. Um, Ultimately, what we want to do, of course, is we want to find the structural parameters that make these utilities consistent with our observed choices. That's, that's a really broad statement. And how exactly we're going to do that, we're going to talk about a lot for the rest of the semester. So that's what I've got on random utility. We're going to dig a level deeper and talk about choice probabilities in the next video. Choice probabilities are going to be a really important aspect to, to understanding and estimating these kinds of models.